History of the Khulafa Rashidin Session 11 Khalid ibn Walid comes to the rescue in Asham. The leaders of the four Muslim armies were constantly monitoring the movements of Roman forces and what they saw and learned astonished them. Never before had Muslims faced such a grave danger. True, during the days of the Prophet, they were frequently outnumbered. True, the apostate uprising posed a serious threat to the stability of the Muslim nation. And true, conquering Iraq was not an easy task. But none of that compared to the danger faced by Abu Bakr's four armies in Asham. Their Roman foes greatly outnumbered them. Furthermore, each of the four Muslim armies was left isolated so that if it was attacked and surrounded by Roman forces, none of the other three armies could be of any help. The four Muslim generals convened an emergency meeting in a place called Jawlan. And while Abu Ubaid ibn al-Jarrah sent a letter to Abu Bakr explaining the situation of Muslims in Asham, he didn't wait for a reply, but instead, along with the other three leaders, decided that their only choice was to retreat as quickly as possible. And here, I am not referring to a minor retreat, but one that involved withdrawing the four armies all the way back to the borders of Asham and giving up control of the cities and villages they had conquered when they first entered the region. On the surface of it, Muslims seemed to be conceding defeat, but that was far from the case. Their withdrawal from conquered lands was in their best interests, bringing them one step closer to victory and not defeat. By withdrawing and uniting in a single location, Muslims avoided being attacked one army at a time. Instead, they chose to fight together in a single decisive battle against the enemy. This was contrary to Heracles' plans, for all along Heraclius had hoped to isolate and destroy each of the four armies. If the Muslims were going to withdraw and meet at a single location, they had to choose that location carefully. Amr ibn al-As suggested to the other three leaders that they gather in a place called Yarmouk. Shortly thereafter, a letter from Abu Bakr arrived and he, radiallahu anh, having approved of the planned withdrawal, too suggested that his four armies meet in Yarmouk. That Amr and Abu Bakr agreed on Yarmouk was based on Yarmouk's strategic importance, less a coincidence than an instance of great minds thinking alike. Having agreed upon the place they would meet, the four leaders agreed that during the process of withdrawing their forces, it was in their best interest to avoid clashing with the enemy as much as possible. Putting their plan into action, Abu Ubaid ibn al-Jarrah withdrew from Hims, Shurahbil ibn Hasana withdrew from Jordan, and Yazid ibn Abi Sufyan withdrew from Damascus. Whereas these three leaders successfully retreated to Yarmouk, Amr ibn al-As did not fare so well. He attempted to withdraw from Palestine in stages, but only succeeded in executing a full withdrawal after. But the enemies surrounding him did not allow him to do that. In this dire and dangerous situation the Muslims were facing in Asham, Abu Bakr knew that he needed a leader who had the ability of Abu Ubaid ibn al-Jarrah, the cleverness of Amr ibn al-As, the wisdom of Ikrimah, and the courage of Yazid ibn Abi Sufyan. He needed all of these qualities in one person, not to mention experience in warfare. The one person who had all of these qualities in addition to many years of battle experience and the ability to make correct decisions under stress, not to mention various other important qualities 
undisputed and undefeated in his battles before and after Islam was none other but Khalid ibn Walid Abu Bakr sent immediate orders to Khalid to rush to the spot of danger with half of the troops in Hira and put Muthanna ibn Haritha in Hira with the other half of the troops. He was also commanded to take charge of the joint command as the supreme commander once he reaches Asham. With the receipt of these orders from headquarters, Khalid ibn Walid, the sword of Allah, hurried to Syria with a contingent of 10,000 soldiers leaving an equal number in Hira with Muthanna ibn Haritha to defend the Muslim lands in Iraq. However, the task that lay ahead of Khalid was to say the least daunting. Somehow he was supposed to enter Asham as soon as possible in order to help the Muslim army that was stationed there along with not being intercepted and attacked by Roman armies that were guarding the borderlands between Iraq and Asham. Perhaps it would have been easier for him to have been assigned the task of putting a camel through a needle. Nonetheless, Khalid, as is the case with all great military leaders, was not discouraged in the least. And rather than complain about a difficult situation, he looked for a solution. To make matters even more difficult, the only way Khalid ibn Walid could do this was to take a path probably never traveled before by an army. A path through a vast desert deprived of all sorts of life. For he could not take the traditional path from Iraq to Asham since it was being guarded by heavily armed Roman armies. Khalid gathered his guides, men who knew the pathways of the entire region, and others who knew the stars well and so were expert night travelers, and said to them, what path can I take so that when I get to the other side of the desert, I will have gone by the Roman armies that guard the borders between Asham and Iraq? For if I am forced to face them, they will hold me back and prevent me from helping the Muslims in time. All of the guides agreed that there was only one road that met Khalid's criteria, and it was a road that was rarely used. Moreover, it was a road that was meant for a hardy traveler or two, and not for an entire army that was accompanied by horses and camels. The guide said to Khalid, we know of only one such road, and it cannot be crossed by armies. By Allah, even a lone rider would fear traversing it by himself. Therefore, you, given the fact that you have horses and supplies, will not be able to traverse it. For one is required to travel along it for five full nights without coming across any source of water whatsoever. For horses, need nourishment and water and heavy supplies will slow you down and yet Khalid remained resolute if he was going to succeed in his mission and if he was going to avoid the Roman armies that guarded the border between Iraq and Asham he would have to travel by the strange and dangerous road that was being described to him seeing that Khalid was thus determined Rafi'ah Ibn Umayr, one of the guides, suggested that they carry as much water as possible. Given the desperate circumstances, Khalid resorted to desperate means. Khalid, in fact, suggested that his men fill the stomachs of his thirsty camels with water, and further ordering them to tie up the insides of those camels, thus preventing the water from escaping through urination. In order to raise the spirits of his soldiers, Khalid said to them, Verily, as long as Allah's help is with him, a Muslim should not be bothered by any predicament he finds himself to be in. The journey 
was difficult for one main reason. Khalid was traveling with an army that consisted not just of men, but of horses and camels as well. Therefore, he had to get to the other side of the desert with all of his men and riding animals not just alive, but in good health and ready for battle. A single rider might hope to traverse the dangerous road, a road that for five days of travel was deprived of all sources of water since he only had to worry about providing drink for himself and his horse. Khalid, on the other hand, had to worry about providing water for all of his soldiers and all of the horses and camels that were accompanying his army. Rafi'a prepared 20 camels by depriving them of water for a number of days and then making them drink until their stomachs were full. Next, he tied up their insides thus preventing the water from leaking out through urination. He then said to Khalid, now you can travel with the horses and supplies. Once all preparations for departure had been made, Khalid's guide, Rafi'a, led the army along a path that was at once rugged and barren. There were no distinctive marks along the way. Everything was desert and wasteland and everything looked the same, especially the part of the desert that extended from a place called Qawaqir to Siwa. Khalid told his soldiers that despite the many disadvantages of the path, taking it was necessary in that it would enable them to travel unnoticed and to take their enemy by surprise. Every time the Muslims stopped to make camp, a few of the water-filled camels would be slaughtered and every member of the army would take something to drink. In this manner, they were able to travel a long distance. Muslims would rest by day and travel by night. And Khalid عنه, relied on Rafi'a as his guide once he came to trust his judgment. Khalid ibn Walid was right in trusting Rafi'a for Rafi'a provided expert advice, making sure they stayed on course so that they could arrive at their destination as quickly as possible. Khalid ibn Walid also employed the services of another guide. Because he was knowledgeable about the names, positions and formations of stars, Mihraz was an expert guide for night travel. So with the help of both Rafi'a and Mihraz, the Muslim army was able to travel both by night and in the morning, and they would stop to rest just before noontime when the sun was at its peak and the stars were invisible. Khalid Radilan forbade all of his soldiers from walking. He ordered them to ride because he wanted to keep them as strong as possible for the unknown dangers that awaited them once they entered Asham. On the fifth day of travel, the army completely ran out of water, and Khalid ibn Walid feared that some of his soldiers might die of thirst. And so he consulted Rafi'a. Ah. Fortunately for the soldiers, Rafi'a ah was familiar with the area. He knew that there were small trees nearby and that a small spring flowed underneath them. He ordered Muslim soldiers to search the area for a specific tree. When a group of soldiers found not the tree, but some stalks that were probably connected to its roots, Rafi'a ordered them to dig in the vicinity of the stalks. They did so. And after a short period of digging, a small source of water appeared. Whatever the size of the source, it was enough to quench the thirst of everyone in the army. Prior to the journey, Khalid ibn Walid was informed about the said tree. Some Arabs had said to him, if you reach such and such tree, then you and those that are with you will have been saved. If you don't reach it, you will all be destroyed. The story of this journey 
illustrates Khalid's genius and his willingness to face dangers and take risks as long as doing so meant achieving key military goals. On the fifth day of their journey, Khalid ibn Walid and his men reached the border of Asham. More important than reaching the border, the army went around and thus left behind a number of Roman army units that were guarding the main roads that led from Iraq to Asham. Thus, Khalid ibn Walid and his men managed to slip into Roman territory unnoticed, all because of the brilliant strategy of taking a dangerous yet unguarded path. After he entered Asham and while he was on his way to join the Muslim armies that were stationed there, Khalid ibn Walid stopped to conquer the city of Busra. Then he headed straight for Yarmouk, and upon arriving there, he met up with three of the four military commanders that were stationed in Asham, Abu Ubaid, Shurahbil, and Yazid ibn Abi Sufyan. Amr ibn al-As was not there. He was still trying to retreat successfully from Palestine. While Amr was desperately trying to get back to Yarmouk, the opposing army pursued him, slowing down his movement and constantly trying to force him into an all-out battle. The last thing Amr wanted was to fight the enemy, since they greatly outnumbered his army. And since Abu Bakr's strategy was to face the enemy with one large army at Yarmouk, rather than with four small armies in various parts of Sham. While Amr ibn al-As was busy in one part of Asham, Khalid ibn Walid was busy in another part, drawing up military plans and analyzing the strengths and weaknesses of both his and his enemy's armies. And yet Khalid did not forget Amr, who at the time was slowly retreating along the banks of the Jordan River, and who was being chased into fighting by a much larger and more powerful army. In regard to Amr, Khalid ibn Walid knew that he was faced with two choices. Either he could hurry towards Amr and together alongside him fight the army that was pursuing him, or he could send word to Amr and order him to retreat on his own. Khalid ibn Walid chose the former option and for more than one reason. First, Amr ibn al-As needed the help. If Amr were to be left on his own, retreating to Yarmouk would be a long and hard process. Second, if along with Amr, Khalid عن, managed to defeat the opposing army, he would have succeeded in weakening the enemy, scattering their forces, and giving the Muslims both the advantage and momentum in the decisive battle that was soon to take place at Yarmouk. And third, if he and Amr defeated the enemy, Roman forces would become depleted to the point that it would be possible for Muslims to attack them from more than one front. Therefore, Roman commanders would be forced to alter their strategy in order to protect themselves from all fronts. So in effect, after a long period of having followed an offensive strategy, Romans would now be forced to be on the defensive and that would represent an important shift in the overall war. Khalid ibn Walid sent word to Amr ibn al-As, ordering him to continue to retreat in slow, measured stages until he arrived with his army, at which time they would face the enemy together. By the time Khalid arrived with a large number of soldiers, Fighting between Amr's army and the enemy had just begun. In total, the Muslim army, which was made up of both Amr and Khalid's men, consisted of 30,000 soldiers. The fighting was intense, but in the end, it was mainly the superior leadership skills of Khalid and Amr that made the difference. 
their army achieved a resounding victory against the enemy. In fact, one unit of soldiers pierced through the ranks of the Roman army, all the way until they reached and then killed the opposing army's leader. With the death of their leader, Roman soldiers lost hope and began to flee in different directions. Ajnadain was the first major battle between Muslims and Romans in Asham. And that is what this battle was being called, based on the location. Heraclius, who was at a safe distance from the battle, soon learnt about its results. Not just an emperor, but a man of war as well. Hiraqal understood the calamity of the defeat. The tide was shifting, and just one more major defeat could mean the end of his empire. Heraclius' counterpart in al Madina also found out about the results of the battle, that is Abu Bakr Learning about it through a letter he received from Khalid, a letter that ran as follows. To Abdullah Abu Bakr, the Khalifa of the Messenger of Allah, from Khalid ibn Walid, the Sword of Allah, that is being used against the polytheists. To proceed, Assalamu alaikum. Peace be upon you. Verily I say to you that all praise is for Allah. None has the right to be worshipped but Him. O oh, as siddiq I am writing to inform you that we have met with the enemies. They had gathered a huge force for us at a place called Ajnadain and swore by Allah that they would not flee until they forced us to leave their lands or destroyed us. So we went out to them, placing our trust in and depending only on Allah. We attacked them with spears, and then we resorted to our swords, and we fought them in every mountain pass and valley. I praise Allah for honoring His religion, for humiliating his enemies and for doing well by his obedient slaves. And may peace and the mercy and blessings of Allah be upon you. When this letter reached Abu Bakr, he was overcome with joy and he said, All praise is for Allah who has helped Muslims and who has made that victory and the news I received the delight of my eyes.